Life with Mary Walter. To Life with Mary Walter. Life with Mary Walter. With Mary Walter. Listening to Life with Mary Walter. Life with Mary Walter. Hello. Yes. How you doing? I'm doing good. 
Good. Welcome to Life with Mary Walter. If you are new to the show, uh, this is a politically free podcast that we do. Uh, we <laughs> Every now and then your brain needs a break. Sometimes we do fun topics. Sometimes we do more serious topics, but no politics, none whatsoever. So uh, we like to relax and do that. And uh, if you have not subscribed to the channel, please do. Please like the please like the uh, the show. You can go to YouTube and you can watch past episodes on YouTube. Uh, just search for Mary Walter Radio because both Life with Mary Walter and Mary Walter Radio are under the same heading. I think in January, YouTube starts with the unique identifiers. So you would just have to go to youtube.com slash Mary Walter Radio when they make those official. And uh, because that's what I got. Couldn't get Mary Walter. Apparently someone took that ahead of me. Um, I don't know who she is and I'll find her. Uh, So I have Mary Walter Radio. So you can do that. And also the audio will be on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So you can go back and listen to old episodes as well. So, uh, have you moved yet, James? No, no. Hold on. Why is my why the background music still on? Isn't it? There it is. I got it off. Okay. No, you're still at home. Oh, there's a U-Haul box. U-Haul box. I said U-Haul. U-Haul box. <laughs> James is going to be moving here. to Baltimore. What, what's what's Baltimore's nickname? The what is Baltimore called? B Town. No, it's got some name like. I don't know, Silver City, what I I don't know. Mugging Central, don't walk Mugging out Central. after dark. <laughs> Pretend you're Jewish, be home by sundown, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> a couple of those, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um I had an exciting day today. I didn't think I'd be able to do the podcast today. Actually, I had an exciting day yesterday. So um I get, you know, I'm very responsible with my health. So I get my skin cancer screening every year and every single year they find something. So, it, you know, I cut something out of the back of my leg last year, a little something off my back the year before that. And this year I thought I was getting off scot free and she's like, well, you know, cause they have this thing that's like a, um, a jeweler's loop almost. It's like this thing, they look at your skin and it's got like a blue light around it. And I guess cancerous cells light up a different color wait, than like, wait everything else you got on you freckles and, and sunspots and old age spots about all that stuff so she goes i see some spots in your face that are precancerous, which is not news i've had something cut out up here so that's not news and listen to this did you know that in america you're more likely to get um skin skin cancer on this side of your face your left side and on your left hand and your left arm do you know why car window yes Really, because yes, of the car. Yeah. In England, you're more likely to get it on the right side of your face, your right hand, and your right arm. Isn't that wild? That is. But yeah, we're real it's... exposed, right? We're still just beating on this all the time, right on that side. Yep. And that's the side that I've had it cut out on, right? So apparently now they don't just cut it out anymore, which I guess is a good thing. But it was really freaky to me. It was like a little scary. Like I didn't know what to expect. And I went online and I read reviews like, oh, yeah, it's really super painful. I thought it was done. I was like, oh, no. So I went and the tech, like I never see a doctor. I've, I've never met the actual dermatologist in this dermatology office. It's always a PA. I've never actually met a doctor. And, um, and, and they put this cream on your face and it's just a little shiny. You can't really notice anything. So, and then you go, you go away for two hours and you come okay. back and you sit down and there's this thing that's about 18 inches high and it's a, a you. And you sit there and they move it up close to your face and you have goggles on, you have goggles that you have to wear and you keep your eyes closed and they put this light on you. So apparently the cancerous cells absorb the, um, the cream that they put on your face. The rest of your face does not. And when you hit it with this blue light, the blue light treatment, when you hit it with this light, the, the, the cream absorbs that light and the idea is is that it burns the the cancer cells and then they're gonna they're gonna get red and they're gonna eventually get flaky and scrape off and fall off like that that's that's the process right so i thought today i was gonna look like i've been in a fight with a rabid badger right so that's where, where, where i thought i was going i woke up this morning and the only thing was under my eyes were really red and i had like bags under my bags like bags under my normal bags and I look like I, somebody punched me in both eyes overnight, but just at the bottom. I was like, huh, nothing on my nose. Like they told me there's stuff on my nose, nothing on my nose, nothing on my forehead. The rest of my face, not blotchy. 
I was like, all right. So, to, you know, took a shower. I was supposed to do TV after this and I, I'm like, I can't do it because I don't think I can cover these things up. Like I look like I've been punched. After I took my shower, I laid down, put some cold compresses on my eyes to try to get the swelling to go down. Gone. So my wow. face didn't get red at all. Nothing on my face got red. So I don't know whether I should be grateful that they were wrong and there was nothing there or should I feel ripped off because <laughs> because I went through this whole process and there was nothing there. Well, let's backtrack. Uh, okay. I'll help you with this one. Tell me first, what was your pain level from one to 10? Um, okay. So my pain level was interesting. Um, when, it, when you sit there and, and you sit under the light, they give you a little handheld fan right. and it, it's, and she said it has three levels. You know, if you're uncomfortable, you can hold the fan under you or above you or whatever to get it in there. And it, it works. It really does work. Cause it's not like right up against your face. The U is like out a little bit. So you have some space, sure. right? Right. So, cause I'm claustrophobic and I was like, that puppy is going to be like, this is like being in an MRI machine right now. Um, <laughs> just see what James A says here. It makes yeah. sense with all those middle fingers, fingers pointing outside of the driver windows, especially in New Jersey. Uh, Al says a blue light special. I'm pretty sure this was expensive, but I hit my deductible because I broke my leg this year. So my insurance company is paying for it. Well, they pay, they would pay for it anyway, I think, because I get one yearly skin cancer screening because I had skin cancer before. So, uh, but anyway, so my pain levels, when I was sitting in this thing and I sat in there, you sit anywhere from 14 to 17 minutes, depending on your skin tone. So I guess fairer skins in there longer because I was in there for 16 minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> they burned that sucker out, didn't they? Wow. Exactly 16 minutes and 40 seconds. And then the timer went off. Um, and I thought I was like waiting for like the fires of hell to be burning into my face. And I wound up putting the little handheld fan on about halfway through just because I was starting to sweat, but it didn't burn. And she said, some people feel like a, like you wake up the next morning, it feels like a really bad sunburn. And we recommend that you put cold compresses on your face. And it's like, Oh God, um, not, and I have zero pain ever through the whole process. None. So no pain. And you answered my second question. No money. Mm, could have been worse. I, mean, I guess. I've done far but, worse, but far less. I guess a great expensive way to find out that the PA was wrong. Right. Or it went real easy for you. But like nothing got red. So that means, but nothing got red. So that means nothing's going to peel off. Nothing's going to come off. If there's oh, something oh, I got on. It. I thought I was assuming that part where you have punch under your eye was it. That's how it manifested. Well, but they, they didn't say I had any any precancerous cells here. It was here on the side of my nose. And then when she was putting the cream on, she goes, oh, I can feel some. I see some over here. Nothing on my nose. Like you figure you would get it on your nose because it sticks out. You know, like if you get it on your nose, nothing. Nothing. We say all the time. Yeah. We call a person who graduates at the bottom of their medical school. That's true. Well, she's and she's not a doctor. She's a physician's assistant. But on the other hand, I guess. My husband was just like, so you're, he goes, so let me see if I have this right. You're upset because you don't have skin cancer. <laughs> I said, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> How dare they not give me some life threatening like I want it. <laughs> no, I didn't want anything life threatening, but I'm like, if I go through it, why can't I at least, you know, it would work and it would peel off. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I, I was all, maybe because I was just mentally prepared for the whole shit, for the whole shebang, you know? This is such yeah. a Seinfeld conversation, isn't it? <laughs> sure Jerry is. being mad about this on a show, like, I don't understand. I'm supposed to have skin cancer. I don't understand why I have skin cancer. They said, it looks like getting an appendectomy to find out it's perfectly good. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but in that situation, they're just going to tell you it was bad and they take it out anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they never go up to go, oh, by the way, your appendix is actually really good. It was nice and plump and fat and looked pretty. They never say that. So we know, so they never looked at it. So. Okay, so we're going to talk uh, later in the show, something that's right up James's alley about songs. And they did a study about how the music you listen to may reflect how you are in relationships and how you view relationships. Mm -hmm. It's super interesting. But I want to start out with this little nugget first. I want to talk about short men. Let's see what Bill says. Glad you're okay. Why is James moving to Baltimore? Well, did, did he pay? You missed an episode there, but I think Bill sees all of them. Go ahead. Why are you moving to Baltimore? Oh, a job opportunity, you know, fun, magic. 
the joy of being in the South? Baltimore is not the South. I don't know how to break that. No, it's not really not technically. I mean, it is below the Mason Dixon line, but well, the Mason Dixon line runs through New Jersey. Cape May is below the Mason Dixon line. Okay, but they just well, didn't continue it across. <laughs> have you been to Cape May? I love Cape May. I was just in Cape May in October. I like Cape May. Yeah, I love does, Cape May. I do too. But it does feel more like Maryland than it does New Jersey. I guess. Well, it's really more Philly than anything, but. I considered like Washington, D.C., the South. And then when you get into Virginia, when you see magnolia trees, you're like, oh, okay, here we go. I'm yeah, in the there. South now. I'm yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. If you close when there's a dusting of snow, you're in the South. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And when there's a dusting of snow, they lose their uh, one inch of snow and they lose their minds. Every store is closed. Schools are closed. Government's closed. Everything's closed with one inch of snow. And I'd be like, you know, I drove here, right? Like. <laughs> This is no big deal. There's like an inch of snow outside. <gasps> you should be really careful. I'm like, it's going to be melted in a couple of hours, right? <laughs> I was in Florida when it was 49. Those people thought they were going to die. They were like, oh, God, it's so cold. I don't know what we're going to do. It's 49. <laughs> so funny. Um, speaking of cold, uh, Hubby's skiing. He went on a quick trip. So cool. he's in Montana skiing. I see. Good job. He said... They're getting slammed with snow with some of the what yesterday was one of the top 10 ski uh, ski days of his life. So he's super happy. So I'm happy for him. So, nice. all right, let's talk about short men. How tall are you, James? Five, seven, five, eight. Shortish. Okay. Cause I'm five, seven. Yeah. So we're about the same height. So yeah. yeah so that that's considered somewhat short yeah. uh, for, for a guy. So a study was done at the university of rock in Poland and <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to pronounce words that have two W's in them and an R and lots of other letters. The lead author, Monica Kozlowska, they, they found that um, when people in general cannot be physically formidable, they may become psychologically formidable instead. Shorter people with traits such as psychopathy can use them to demand respect, impose costs on others, and impress romantic partners. Appearing more powerful may in turn make other people perceive them as taller than they really are. Because we do equate height with power. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you're big. You're a big person. You're like, oh, you could kick my butt. You know, like that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, for this study, they investigated the Napoleon complex, which you've all heard of the Napoleon complex, named after one man named Napoleon Bonaparte. Um yeah. The Napoleon complex also is also known as short man syndrome. Those are the guys who, did you ever see a guy who has short man syndrome and he walks around like this? Cause he does so much lifting on his upper body to appear, to appear really big. And he walks around like this, you know, like, like I, dude. I worked with that radio guy. I, Five yeah. or four, super built, like, mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so funny. The Napoleon complex is has uh, their characteristics are domineering or aggressive attitude displayed by shorter people, compensating for their lack of height and feelings of inferiority. Napoleon, they don't know how tall he really was, but depending in different his different historical accounts, he was between five two and five seven. So, but there's a big difference. I was five two in fifth grade. Right. And then was five seven at the end of fifth grade, beginning of sixth grade. So there's a big difference between five two and five seven. They're All right, so here's what, really different heights. It gets right? complete, five inches in one year. I grew. But that's a big jump too to say like the guys between five two and five seven. How would that work in a lineup, right? Like between five two and five seven, his skin complexion's like really light but kind of dark. You know, like, <laughs> no description. Thanks. That's why they have those big, it's 7-Elevens. I don't know if they do them at other stores, yeah. but 7-Elevens <laughs> do that. They are next to the yeah. door. They have a big yeah. height chart so that when the robber's running out, if you look at it, you can see where he came up on the chart to give the cops a, a height description. <laughs> um, okay, now, Napoleon was also portrayed by his enemies to be an angry man who sought power and war and... They say that his they they linked his short stature to those attributes, and we do that today. To this day, you know, there's that that image of the really angry guy who's jumping up and down and is all angry, and mad, and he's like four feet tall, right? Like there's that there's that image. Yeah. So they wanted to see this woman wanted to see if there was a connection between men deemed shorter than average and displaying what they call 
the dark triad of personality traits. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I think this is monkey bop. I, I, I think this my uh, father-in-law taught me to never fight the short guy in a bar as they have nothing to lose. <laughs> wise. Very wise. Okay. So the dark triad of personality traits. I've never heard of this. Uh, psychopathy, which is defined by a lack of empathy and antisocial behavior, or at pretty much anyone who works in radio. Um, yeah. Narcissism, a self-centered personality style, pretty much anybody mm -hmm. who works in radio. And Machiavellianism, demonstrating manipulation and indifference towards morality. There's a, dis there's a few in radio who absolutely fit that 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 trait right there a hundred percent and they work in radio not everybody oh. but there are quite a few of them yeah uh james a says try being 5 10 and being three inches taller than your father-in-law and five inches taller than your mother-in-law my wife is five seven. Oh, so he married he married into little people yeah yeah you but, but you have this he is a son he's gonna have a little kid his, his son's gonna be a little guy well maybe he'll take take after his dad um Okay, so researchers surveyed 367 men and women, and they used a questionnaire where participants were asked how strongly they agree with certain phrases, like, I tend to manipulate others to get my way, which I definitely think is more of a female thing than a man thing, because we don't have as much power physically, we don't have as much power. So you learn early on how to manipulate, like growing up with brothers, I could beat them physically until they got bigger than me, and then I couldn't do that anymore. So I had to beat them with my brain. And that was shockingly easy, thank God. So, but you do, you do develop that skill of being able to manipulate people to get them to do what you want, with, you know, especially in a relationship like that with your brothers, you know, because I wasn't right. going to win. So I could beat them with my brain. Okay. From the responses, they were given a score that indicated how strongly they demonstrated psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism, the dark triad of personality. Oh, each right. participant each participant also had to disclose their height as well as indicate how satisfied they were with their height and how frequently they felt this way about it the results showed that shorter participants in both sexes which by the way they only explored only two of the 97 possible genders uh <laughs> both sexes uh both sh so shorter wish to be taller and they tended to score more highly for all three of the dark triad traits both sexes so sure um, you are, the more you're going to find ways to sort of manipulate around it or scheme the system or get around it okay yeah um you're also a, like like to be more narcissistic which i find interesting as well but nar narcissism was particularly strong with the male participants not existent at all for the women so the, because i don't think it's as big of a deal for a woman to be short Short women always oh. wind up with guys who are like twice as tall as they are. Men, tall men love little women because I think they can carry them around and like put them in their pocket. You know, like they love that. You always see like these really tall guys with these five foot nothing girls. You, you see that a lot. And I think, uh, so I don't think it's a big deal for women. No, I think it's harder for a woman to be really tall. Like you remember the plaintiff used to be really tall. Like for her, like finding a guy who's six four whatever her whole life was, was tough. Like finding a... How how tall is the plaintiff? Six, just like six one ish. Yeah, my nieces are like I'm the Smurf in the. Yeah. I was just having a conversation with my aunt about that today, because my father, the German side of the family, all the men were like six one, six two, big men. They were big guys, right? And I'm five seven. I'm the shortest one of my family. My mother's taller than me. I'm like, how, this is why I'm convinced I was switched to birth. I would think that, but we we all, even my cousins, we all look exactly like the German genes. Uh, the the from my father's side of the family, my cousins, even with different mothers, my cousins, we all look exactly alike. We all look exactly like our grandfather. It's amazing, but I didn't get the height. I don't understand. I'm like, I'm like yeah. a smurf in the family. My nieces are two of them are six one and one of them is six foot. I mean, it's it's crazy. You did say they thought you dropped it on your head at some point. Could be that. 
No, no, no. I think I, I, I truly believe I'm a Kennedy. I, I went through that. I lived that for my life for a really long time, thinking that I was just switched at birth with someone else. Oh, yeah, with yeah. I was switched at birth with poor people. And, and then like when I get together, I'm the only girl on that side of the family. I have no female cousins on that side. It's just me. But if you put me together with my male cousins and you took a picture of all of us, we look like siblings and we all look exactly alike. It's frightening. Exactly. And when I see some of their, when I see their kids, it's the same thing. We all look exactly alike. Those German genes are like, boom, they are so strong. It's crazy. Yeah, totally. It's crazy. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything. I don't know. It's because their German genes are what, but that side of the family dominates big time. Well, they did have um, a number of years there where they thinned the herd out pretty hard. So and kind of kept a yeah. <laughs> My grandparents left the country before that happened. <laughs> they got out. They beat feet when they saw it coming. So right. Smart. It's wise. I mean, there's still a lot over there. I mean, the vast majority of the family is still over there. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so no narcissism for the women. Shorter men can demand respect, impose, co impose costs on others and acquire resources and impress romantic partners by their traits. Shorter women can use deception to appear more desirable or to gain protection and resources. Appearing more powerful may in turn affect others' perceptions of one's estimated height. So, um, the men survey showed that men obtained higher scores than women in uh, moral disengagement and the triad of dark personality traits. Again, I don't think it's a big deal for a woman to be shorter. Like you could be four foot nothing. Everybody thinks you're cute. You know, like you're always cute. And I, that stinks. It's like horrible when you're younger because you don't want to be cute. You know, you want to be, you know, when you're growing up, you want to be seen as cute. You want to be seen as pretty or, or something like that. But then when you get into like college and stuff, men love it. So now you're like, wow, this rocks. I'm cute, you know? <laughs> and then you ride that cute train all the way to your Betty White years. Like no one's gonna oh, use yeah. the word, no one's gonna use the word cute in conjunction with me for like another another good 20 years. I'm just now I'm just old. Like, like I don't hit cute for another 20 years. Okay. Right? Like <laughs> by the short cute standard, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know what's funny is then think about like how it is opposite for a guy. Like look how it is to be somebody like Prince, right? Like I know right. there's questions about his masculinity or whatever on some level, but I mean it's a weird thing about Prince. He's super short. He had that weird thing where he could kind of dress like a girl and get away with it without mm -hmm. like without you know like not making him still seem masculine in some weird way. Like you never thought yeah. like Prince has problem problem with ladies, right? Like and he was what four wow. eleven five foot. Prince also was very wealthy and he made up for what he lacked in stature. He made up for with a big wallet. So agreed. I think that definitely happened later, but even early on, like he just sort of had that thing like that. Mm, maybe. It, I, and by the way, it's rare. I mean, money, of course, uh, definitely helped, but I mean, it's weird. Like he had that commanding thing you're talking about on mm -hmm. some weird level, right? Like he was small and also his band had like commanding respect for him. In a way, like, even when you're getting paid, sometimes you don't always have respect. You know what I mean? Like, but he was able to, like, command respect from the band and from – it's a strange dude. Was, I know kind of what they yeah. were saying. He's five foot and had that thing, you know? Well, Joe Jonas and Tom Holland are both 5'8", and both of their wives are taller than them, Sophia Turner and Zendaya. They're both much taller than them, you know? I, I know someone – well, I, I have family where um, the woman is is – taller than her husband but she wears flats everywhere she goes mm -hmm. i could never do that i mean granted two broken feet and three foot surgeries later i don't wear a lot of heels but <laughs> i like to be able to wear heels you know i don't i i i would have a hard time i think with somebody shorter than me that would be that'd be tough i mean i'm that not that the, tall but that is the extension of the question like does that even still matter to you right like how not, many people does it matter to because I don't care about tall women. I mean, I don't have a, th I mean, I've dated a few. So, I mean, it seems like I have a thing for them, but I don't, I don't have a thing for short women or tall women. That's not part of my care, mm -hmm. right? I just, you know, it was never my thing. Well, I never, I, I, when I was dating, I would, I never dated short men. I always dated like big guys, like right. dated a lot of bouncers, a lot of cops, like a lot of that. There was, I'm sure there's some kind of deep psychological thing going on with that. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, I always, I was, I'm sorry. Did you seemingly have a type? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. Not anymore. Uh, Tom Cruise can't get on most rides at Disneyland, and he's made mega 
exactly right. So fun fact about Tom Cruise, who lived in Glen Ridge, New Jersey. My aunt was his physics teacher, and she said he was a box of rocks. <laughs> really? Yes. He's not smart. Yeah. And yet he got into a physics class or attempted a physics class. That's in smart. high school. In high school. Yeah, high school physics is not exactly high school physics. They yeah. let me in, yeah, and yeah, I can't yeah. do math. I was in I was in like math for morons class. Like I was in like second grade math class in high school. You know, because I I can't with numbers. I just can't. Um, but they let me in, you know, but she said he, he didn't want to do the work. He was lazy. She didn't. Nope. So whatever. two plus two is seven, but quantum entanglement, boy, that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, we didn't go into anything like that when I was, when I was in high school. All right, let's roll on. We talked about the net. Oh, look at the time already. Holy Christmas. This show flies. Okay. We're going to, we're going to do the music stuff coming up. So hang on tight. Uh, I thought this was interesting. It's about seniors. Because, I, you know, we're all going to be there someday. Some of us are already there. So I thought this was interesting. Um, they found, especially with inflation, thanks, Joe, 34% uh, of older Americans are worried about affording their medication in the future. So they did a health-focused survey of 2,000 seniors, and they found that 35% said they've cut down on costs and other aspects of their life in order to have enough money to afford their health care needs. Now, that sounds terrible. Oh, seniors can't pay for their medication. But I think if you get away from seniors and you look at other groups, I think everyone has cut down or cut back on costs somewhere along the line in order to make ends meet in other areas. You know, like we've yeah. cut down because food is so expensive. We don't go out nearly as much as we used to, right? In right. order to be able to buy the food for the house. Heads of lettuce are like the size of softballs now. I told my husband, I'm like, why don't we just grow our own? Like, it's crazy. So, I mean, this could be just as devastating for a family that has somebody on medication. Seniors just take more medication than others, than other groups. So it sounds like, it sounds terrible. Like, oh, grandma can't afford her medication. Yeah, but you know what? This family over here, you know, had to get rid of their dog because they couldn't afford to feed it anymore. You know, like, so I think everyone's yeah. cutting back. So this is just a little, a little skewed in that sense. But they did admit they only were looking at seniors and healthcare costs. So that's why. Well, I was going to say, you could probably extend that out and go exactly what you're saying. At the rising cost of medical care and, you know, and prescriptions, I'm sure is affecting everybody. Look at what insulin's going for for people who need insulin. Hey. Bonkers not prices. to get political, Trump yeah. capped that and Joe Biden came in and overturned it. So there you go. You know, but hey, no mean tweets. Um, <laughs> to pay for, <laughs> we can't, we can't. <laughs> We're back. We'll do that thir Thursday. Thursday, That's we it. talk politics on Thursday, 7.15. Right here on Getter and YouTube again, and the audio will be on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And again, please subscribe and like the podcast. We do appreciate that. Um, to pay for their health care, one in five respondents, 19%, say that they've stopped paying for necessities like rent or mortgage. Oh, that, that's not. That's a real problem, especially when you're a senior. Yeah. And 20% um, have cut down on groceries in order to pay for medical costs. Again, I, I think a lot of people have cut down on groceries or other things, but cutting down on your rent or mortgage, that one's tough. I, I think to me, this just highlights that you have to save for when you get older. My father drilled that into my brain and every financial advisor I've had along the way, every tax guy we've had along the way, my father, I remember him telling me when I was first starting to work. You pay yourself first. You always take money out of your paycheck and you put it in the bank and you put it in savings and you don't touch it. You don't touch it. That money cannot be touched unless there's like some catastrophic emergency. And then at the end of every year, you take half that money out and you give it to a you know, financial guy to invest for you. That's what you do because you're not going to have Medicare. You're not going to have Social Security. It's not going to be there for you. You're going to pay into it your whole life, but you're not going to get it. Mm hmm. And so this idea of, oh, I can't pay my rent or I can't pay my mortgage. I'm like, you know, what you do your whole life? My husband and I live below our means. We do. We got our we got a, our first couch when we were after we were married for like 20 years was when we got our first couch. Everything else had been hand me down. I can't, we didn't buy furniture. Everything was hand me down. People were like, we're getting rid of it. I'm like, oh, I'll take it. OK. You know, so we've lived below our means purposely. 
so that we have a war chest built up for when we get older. And part of that's because he's in healthcare and he sees these seniors who can't afford anything, you know, and their kids are in charge or you wind up on with the government paying for it. I got news for you. If you're dependent on the government to pay for like extended care or anything like that, ooh, you're not going to a nice place. Options no. are not real great. No, they are not. But hey, the government's paying for it. And that's what we want for everybody. You know, they're very like Russian gulag, those places. Okay. Um, they found the, the poll conducted by one poll found that three and four seniors struggle to afford certain aspects of their health care, at least some of the time. I understand it. I, I get it. It's expensive. Yeah. Uh, 38% said health care is more expensive now than they remember it ever being. Of course it is. There's a lot of things that factor into that. You know, having someone who coming, marrying into a family that is deeply entrenched in the healthcare industry. Who do you think is paying for all the illegals who are getting health care for free? Who do you think's paying for all the people who just don't pay their bills? Who do you think's paying for the drug addicts and the alcoholics who wind up in the hospital time after time after time because they've overdosed or they've passed out on the sidewalk or something like that? Who do you think pays for all those people? Who do you think pays for their medication? Who do you think pays the nurses' salaries? Doctors a lot of times don't get paid and Medicare just cut, cut back on costs for uh, the, what they're going to pay doctors. They're, that's how they're balancing it by they're just not paying the doctors. And then you have fewer doctors who accept it, right? Fewer doctors are like, I'm not going to make any money on this. I'm not doing it. So, you know, who pays for the ICU when you've got someone, you know, who's in construction and who's in the country illegally and winds up in the ICU and is, is clocking in several thousand dollars a day in care? Who pays for that? We do. We do. That's why it's getting more expensive. That's one of the factors as to why it's getting more expensive. It's not because of the big pharma, you know, greedy pharmaceutical companies. Well, that maybe, greedy. that's I part mean, of it. That's part well, of it. Yeah, it's not only because that is your point. Yeah. Right. The, the, only... But that's who everybody likes to point the finger at. But sure. if you look at the number of people in this country who receive free health care and the percentage and that number is growing. I mean, we just added we're on track to add eight million people in this country illegally at the by the end of Biden's term who are all going to get free health care. Who's going to pay for eight million more people on the public dole for health care? And you think the costs are going to get you're surprised that the cost is going up. Um, 96 percent of seniors already take medication. Makes sense. Um, the average respondent takes six different prescriptions a week. Oof. At what point does it become quality of life over quantity of life? You know, there's a little of that. And, and I, I don't want to bring up my medical problems in a sense. Like we've done this before. I've had some medical challenges. They sort of changed my life. And that's the problem when you like, I, I, I have a couple friends I know just, you know, they knew I went to high school with or whatever. And I see the health issues they go through just by being perpetually unhealthy. Right. Not alone, right? Like, I mean, I, I know I took a bunch of flack for it, but wasn't that one of the things Joe Rogan was talking about during the pandemic? Like, also because of the pandemic, but shouldn't we all just think about being, is it, shouldn't it just be a wake-up call for the, everybody just to be healthier? Because right. one of the things that fights things like that off really well is just being healthy. Now, that's not going to save everybody, but it's certainly going to help everybody. Right. Right. But right? you know, per personal is a lot of people. Just personal responsibility is not big. Not a lot of people like personal responsibility, you know? Um, and yeah, I, listen, get it. I have, I have classmates, people that I went, went to, to high school with who I look at now and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, and they just don't help themselves and they're obese or, you know, they're, they can't walk or you know they're and some listen some of it obviously is genetics you you got to look at the cards you were dealt as well you know if you if you want to live long pick your parents well you know there's that saying you know if yeah, you yeah, want to exactly, you know yeah. there, there's that as well but i got those strong german genes so i got that going on um <laughs> my dad's 91 no my dad just turned 90 yeah my dad just turned 90 my mom's 89 you know so they're they're up there but they're doing great they're doing i mean They've got their health challenges, you know, um, sure. we've talked about that. And I was just like, oh, I don't know if I want to, I don't want to deal with that, you know, but you can't help a lot of it. It's not because it's stuff that they did or didn't do. It was just literally genetics, but a lot of it is, can be, you, you can help yourself. 
Uh, let's see, 47% anticipate needing to take more prescribed medications as they get older. Uh, uh, a sixth of respondents think it's important to save up their money now to help afford medications in the future. Yes, that's a good idea. Yes. Um, three in 10 seniors would rate the, av the uh, availability and cost. 31% say um, that uh, the cost and the availability of primary doctors are near them are good or excellent. And I would think that that's because a lot of times these people live in senior communities and there's a lot of doctors around. So They're the care is good or excellent because they can literally walk right in. 18% um, right. um, said uh, availability and 20% said cost of prescribed medications near them is only fair or poor. Um, let's see. Um, they want a, a lot of them would like good health care that would allow them to have more money to spend on leisure activities. Well, wouldn't we all want to have more money to spend on leisure activities? I hear you. Well, for seniors, I mean, I get the con con concept. You worked your whole life. You want a little time to not have, you know, right. whatever you call it when you're a hundred percent. But I don't think that's the government's job. I think oh, that's you. No, no, yeah, not the right. Government. It's no, your job. That's yeah, important, not the government's job, though. Right. No. It's your job to save and put away for when you get older, because God forbid something happens to you, you know, apparently smothering your partner with a pillow in the middle of the night to get rid of them is, you know, um, is, is illegal. So you got to spend should medical care on them. <laughs> yeah. Well, it should be legal, but I mean, you know, it's, you're right. It's just not. <laughs> That's legal in Oregon now, though, right? I have everything. Yeah, everything is. It's, 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 <laughs> Canada, you know, they're like, yeah. here, we'll, we'll assist, we'll assist it like, you know, right out of here. Um, and we don't have the knowledge base for this. This isn't even technically the topic, but I do find the assisted suicide question pretty fascinating. I do, too. About? It is a pretty fascinating topic where you land on that and usually why you land in certain places, but. You know, I just went to a, an event at the at the Stone Pony on Saturday. Um, it has happens every year, and I want to. I know we're delving into something different, but um, it's for ALS, Lou Gehrig's yeah. disease, no cure, and your brain still functions, but your body you slowly lose control of your body, and you it's a death sentence. You know it's going to come. Now, Stephen Hawking lived with ALS for something like most of his life. You know, he just he he just kept going and going and going, and his Pretty disease far, never yeah. progressed. Others will walk, you know, my husband is on the board of this chair of this foundation to help these people. And it, the money goes to help them, you know, get the wheelchairs they need. Cause by the time the government gets around to processing your request for like a manual wheelchair and automatic, you've progressed to the point now where you need one that's controlled by breathing into it or something, you know, like they're so far behind. So this organization helps them get the stuff by bypassing the government, just get it. And then we'll worry about the government stuff later. So, um, they had this one family who benefited from the organization. Um, she, she did pass away, but they have this event every year and they had like auction items. You would have loved it. Cause there were, they had Beatles lyrics, handwritten Beatles lyrics in like a frame Ooh. with a picture of the Beatles and, you know, starting bid was, you know, I don't know, $20,000, whatever it was, you know, and, yeah, and yeah. it was one of those things. So, um, but you see the patients there, the patients get to go. And um, it was sad because only one guy came, Steve, who Steve's my buddy. I love Steve. He's hilarious. Um, you know, but he he can't move anything. The only right. thing he can do is breathe into this little straw that helps him pick words on a screen so that he can talk. Right. And we had a blast with him. But, you know, diseases like that, you don't know something like that's going to happen to you. And I now know how the government handles it and how the government responds. It's really scary. So. I don't want to be dependent on the government for that. You know, thank God for this organization in our area that helps it in the state of New Jersey that helps people, but that's not available. It's the only group as far as we know of there. I think there may be one more that, that helps the patients and the money isn't going to try to find a cure. The money is going to help the people who have the disease now, right. you know, to, to deal with it. So, Hello, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. We kind of got off on a tangent there, but, um, I don't know. It was, it, I just felt bad for, for these, you know, seeing them. And then you see people who you saw last year and they're gone and you're like, Oh, you know, yeah. like, Oh man, it's tough. So, you know, that is the right. extension of the thought about medical. I know we're gonna change real quick, but I mean, imagine medical costs getting just so expensive. I mean, I'm sure that's 
Oh, so yeah. That question. <laughs> you know. Sure. It, yeah. It's a lot. And, and, and think of the costs now with kids because every kid now has anxiety and depression and ADHD and D -d 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 and everything else. I'm sorry? It's I'm allergic to kale. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, kale in school because Ricky's allergic to kale. <laughs> Kale's awful. Ugh, tastes yeah. terrible. Have you ever had it? Yeah. Uh, I tried it. it. Oh, do you like them? Well, I mean, you season anything enough and it disappears into just a crispy seasoned something. But I mean, <sighs> they weren't. I, di I didn't eat kale and go, wow, I can't wait to make this part of my diet. You know? Oof. Uh, no, it's too, it's very bitter. It's, um, I don't know. It's like eating bitter grass. Like, you know, when you're a kid and you like try dandelions, like, oh, you can eat them, you know? And so you try like, oh, it's terrible. Yeah. It yeah. just reminds me of eating bitter grass. Um, yeah. So, which is sad that I know what that tastes like. All right. Let's talk about music. All right. Music and romance. Let's talk about music and romance. Um, okay. University of Toronto did a study. Now, the, the researcher is Raven L.A., um, who graduated with a doctorate in the Department of Psychology. And right. what Raven, I'm assuming is a woman, but I'm not 100% sure, so I apologize if I am mis misgendering Raven. All right, so we're going to say she for now. So um, she, know, she said that since humans started making music, songs across cultures always focus on relationships. So she wondered, do people listen to music that, that mirrors their experiences in relationships? Are you drawn to certain music because of your experiences when it comes to relationships? Because it's always about getting the girl, being in the relationship, breaking up, you know, afterwards, I still miss you, that kind of, like, it's, it's, it's always mm -hmm. about the cycle of a relationship. Oh, yeah. So they found that individual attachment styles, okay, how you are in a relationship, how you attach to someone, often correspond with the lyrics of some of your favorite songs. So what they say, people tend to turn to music that describes how they're feeling about their relationships for better or for worse. So in other words, if your truck breaks down and your dog runs away a lot, those are the type of songs you're going to gravitate to in country music. <laughs> Um, she said the lyrics, the lyrics of your favorite songs about relationships may help validate your thoughts and feelings, but may also reveal things about your experiences of relationships that you might not have realized something that you're going through repeatedly that you keep coming up against, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so there are four main categories of relation attachment styles, and this is what they explored. Okay. Anxious, anxiously attached. Though people who are, who are anxiously attached are known to habitually worry about rejection. They see constant reassurance through their relationships, also known as desperate. I think that's what I call them. Those are the desperate ones, or they call them anxiously attached. And like desperation is an ugly perfume. Wait, you sure you're um, not mad at me? Are we cool? Everything's great. We're good, right? You're not mad. You wait, sure wait, everything's fine? Exactly. Wait, what did you mean by that? What did you say? Wait, what? I'm yeah. sorry. Did I say yeah. Yeah. Wait, does Aww. this mean does this mean we're breaking up? Where were you last night? Uh, av avoidantly attached people are the opposite. They tend to be more guarded. They hide their emotions and they avoid intimacy in favor of independence. Okay. okay. If you have a mixed attachment, you're the most annoying of all because come here, come here, come here, go away, go away, go away. Come here, come here, come here, go away, go away, go away. So very confusing, fluctuating between clingy and cold and then secure people have optimistic outlooks on relationships. They're open communicators and they trust their partners. Like, like my husband and I will watch on um, like 90 day fiance or some of these shows. And I'm like, why, why are they, you know, so jealous if he's, if he's got a friend or he's talking to somebody, a woman on social media, who cares? Like our phones aren't locked. My phones, I don't even know how to lock my phone. I mean, my phone's not, I don't care. I get a text and I'll say to him, he's like, oh, you got a text. He'll bring me my phone. I'm like, well, who is it? You know, like, why did oh. you bring me the phone? Just tell me what they said. He's like, I don't want to go on your phone. I'm like, go, who, Ringo, go on my phone. Who cares? I, I, Ringo, I tell Ringo all the time. It's, that's a uh, girlfriend's nickname, oh, Ringo. I tell her all the time, like, hey, can you check my phone for me? Tell me if anybody texts me. Right. And she's reading my text out to me. I'm like, I don't, honestly, and I don't have any, like, a, 
like a lock screen. Like I, I would tell yeah, her, I, I already have that. Like I'm not, it's just a phone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't either. Um, so they asked about 570 people to tell them their favorite songs and they coded the nearly 7,000 songs for the attachment style that the lyrics expressed. They took the, the songs about 7,000 of them and put them in the four categories. Okay. They, they found, consistently found that avoidantly attached people prefer for for music with avoidant lyrics and that was the most popular result was avoidantly attached people so those are people who are like i prefer to be independent i'm just going to hang back a little bit here that's what i'm going to do during this they did a second study and in that study researchers coded over 800 billboard number one hits released between 1946 and 2015, and they analyzed each song for one of the four attachment themes. Hit songs and lyrics, though, they noticed, appear to have become more av avoidant and less secure as time went on. Huh. So they were writing for an audience, if you will. Right. So, or that's what they're singing about. That's what these artists are singing about. Maybe that's because that's what they're feeling more. They're feeling yeah. more detached than, than secure. So they say popular music lyrics are running parallel to sociological trends of social disconnection, people valuing independence over reliance on others and feeling more isolated, which is so true because I, like, I talk about this, I say all the time, I don't know anybody under 40 who doesn't, hasn't been diagnosed with depression or anxiety. Yeah. But yet they're an incredibly unsocial group of people. They're social. Oh, I have friends. I'm like, have you met them? Well, no, but we're friends on social media and or we, we we text each other all the time. Like, what does their face look like when they they you know show me pictures? I'm like, how do you know that's really their face? You know, that my, is my, my favorite thing when people say, like, this is my friend. Oh, really? How do you know them? Oh, oh, we're not actually really friends, we're just friends on Twitter or Facebook. And I'm like, oh, oh, so it's not really your friend. You don't know right. this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So exactly. I, I think that that's part of the reason why it's a very un- social group. I watch my nieces and I don't know how much they do it anymore, but when they were younger, probably like five years ago, um, I went down to the shore with, with my, my niece and, and her mom and her friends for her 16th birthday. And that's a humbling experience as a side note, being on a beach with a bunch of 16 year old girls, that is a very humbling experience. Um, and they made me take my burqa off. So, um, <laughs> like, damn it. Um, but they sat there and nobody was talking. They were sitting in a circle so they could all see each other. And everybody was like this. Mm -hmm. They were Snapchatting each other. I'm like, why don't you just talk to her? <laughs> Back in our day, we just whispered when we wanted to be quiet. We didn't type it. Whisper. Right. It's so weird. Yeah. Um, so they, they talk about Adele. Adele's discography, um, her, her songs are really popular among the participants. It was very widely named. And that... Adele's music leans towards anxious attached themes, anxiously attached, you know, the yeah. insecure ones. Oh yeah. She, then they talk about the song, Someone Like You a play, it appeared on the playlist of a lot of these participants. And here's some of the, they note these lyrics. I hate to turn up out of the blue uninvited, but I couldn't stay away. I couldn't fight it. I had hoped you'd see my face and that you'd be reminded that for me, it isn't over. And I always thought that was like a stalking song. <laughs> It does have a every breath you take kind of feel to it, doesn't it? Hold on, that song's on the list. <laughs> that song's on the list. Shocker. I mean, it's a beautiful song when she sings it. It's absolutely beautiful. But yeah. I always heard it and I was just like, you know, never mind, I'll find someone like you. Like it, it's it's I don't I always thought it was like a creepy stalker song, but at the same time. If you've ever been dumped, you kind of have that period where you're getting over it and you're trying and you have that feeling like, you know, I'm it's not over for me. And and so I get where the song came from. Like yeah. I get it. Sure. Um, whereas every breath you take is way more stalkery than Adele's um someone like you. That's way so, more stalkery. Sting talks about what makes a good song and a good song lyric, and Adele fits in the same situation. It's not I love you or you love me or I love uh, or we dumped each other, right? It's that trio of problem. I love you, you love me, but you're 14 and I'm your teacher. 
Right, that's what, there's a police song. Uh, uh, what's that song? Getting a police. I song. know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't yeah. stand so close, stand to, so me. close to, yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> I, the teacher and the student pull or every breath you take, where it's I'm watching you and I love you, but I'm watching you from back here where I'm not allowed. Right. So right. The, or, the third yeah. element is the wall in front of you. Right. I love you, but you don't realize I'm watching you all the time. Or so analyze, you know. analyze hot for teacher now. <laughs> Uh, I think they, um, they're probably a little more direct. I'm going to go with like, I think they just wanted that teacher. <coughs> All right. Then now that some of these artists, I don't know because I'm old. The Weeknd, I've heard of The Weeknd, yep. but I don't know. I'm not familiar. Um, he has a song called Heartless. Okay. And um, this is the other end of the attachment spectrum, they say. Um, gonna, trying to be a better man, but I'm heartless. Never be a wedding plan for the heartless. Low life. Low life for life because I'm heartless. That's a perfect example of an avoidance song. Yeah. And those are the ones that are more popular right now, supposedly. There's a Let's song see. I sing all the time by a band called Death Cab for Cutie. And the lyric is, uh, you can do better to me, but I can't do better than you. And it just feels another one of those sort of like, uh, I love you, but I'm going to stay back here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, James A says Kanye wrote a song called Gold Digger. Now he pays 200000 a month in child support. Can I just say, I don't understand why anybody pays child support in the Kanye West, Kim Kardashian thing. They both have a stupid amount of money. It's not like she needs that money to support the kid. I, I, I don't understand that at all. Yeah. No, that makes zero sense. Neither of those people should be paying alimony, child support, anything. No. Nobody needs anything. You've got billions. Well, Conway had billions, but Kanye, but he's lost a lot. So maybe he needs to go back to court and renegotiate that. Um, but, you know, they're both billionaires. So really, why, yeah. why are we playing this stupid game? Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, at one older tune that pro that was popular among the participants was, believe it or not, Sonny and Cher's I've Got You, Babe. Okay. And they said that... Um, that it's a manual on how to be securely attached to someone. Put your little hand in mine. There ain't no hill or mountain we can't climb. Okay. Yeah. And they and you don't really hear songs like that anymore. Country music yeah. you sometimes do, but you don't really yeah. hear a lot about that in you know in more popular pop music. You don't hear a lot of that. You don't even hear that kind of Trinity writing that Adele does. That's why I think Adele seems almost like a standout artist at times, right? Because she can write the more complex theme song where a lot of songs now right. I think are really two-dimensional right yeah i'm terrible stay away right or get come here don't leave i want to hear this song between the people comparing them we can share medications you know because i'm depressed and you're anxious so yeah. <laughs> ron says blondie one way or another yes that's another stalker song what is up yeah. with the stalker songs i don't know i mean that also goes to i mean in the same premise it's funny when you find out that a song means something you didn't realize it means, right? Yes. Um, Goodbye Stranger. I just figured out that this is 100% Super real. Tramp. Just hold Ringo. Yeah, by a band called Super Tramp. It's about one night stands. I've sang that song so many times in my life. When you go back and you think of it, it's really about one night stands. That's what he's saying. Goodbye Stranger. It's goodbye, been goodbye. Nice. He's saying all the names he's been with. And don't, don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed because tomorrow you're not going to feel any pain anyway. So let's just do this thing. Yeah. Wow! I, 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 I can. I've played that song. I know the drum parts. I know. I mean, I and, hope you're but, right. Because, yeah. Goodbye, Mary. Goodbye, Jane. Hope we never meet again. Because it's Brit or Brit or Australian right. or whatever. So Jane and again. Right. Wow! Yeah, I've said that song eight million times. So sometimes there's really brilliant songs about, especially about the topic we're talking about. That when you go back and you listen to the lyrics, you're like, oh. They're not just saying it's over. They're saying it's over and I'm still watching you all the time or some like characteristic of a song you never realize until you've contemplated it. Maybe because you're thinking about these kind of themes or you have something on your mind. But yeah. Uh, well, Ringo, my... you know, the one you're with was about a one night stand. I... Oh, well, that, that's out. obvious. That's yeah. obvious. I told my husband, as a joke, I tell my mother that was going to be our wedding song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she went, okay okay she was hilarious because my bridesmaids were black right and back then like that was a no-no but i wanted black and she's like it's your wedding and then we got married close to halloween so i so to really ramp it up i told her that instead of um flowers the girls were going to carry jack-o-lanterns right <laughs> and they're going to be lit up it was going to be really pretty and she's like it's your wedding <laughs> Okay. So when I told her that was going to be our, our our wedding song, she was like, "Okay, it's your wedding." 
Al is still keeping uh, time for us. Thank you, Al. Um, James A says, Obsession by Animation is kind of another one. I don't know that song. I'm going to look it up. Animotion. I'm sorry, Animotion. I don't know that song. I got, I got anything there. I'm old. Um, okay. So here's a, uh, let's see, sunny and share. Now, avoidance songs, Beyonce's Irreplaceable, Chris Brown, Say Goodbye, In Sync, Bye, Bye, Bye. Yeah. Bye, Bye, Bye. Uh, <laughs> Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. Yeah. Billie Jean was not my lover. She's just mm -hmm. a girl that, who claims that I'm the one. Yeah. I, I don't know her. I never saw her. It's not her son, though. It's not my son. I'm just saying. Don't look like me. Yep. Uh, the Weekend, The Hills, Heartless, Rihanna, Take a Bow, TLC, Scrubs. Uh, anxious Songs, Adele, Someone Like You, The Police, Every Breath You Take, Miley Cyrus, Wrecking Ball, uh, Adele, Ball. Adele, Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good one. U2, One. Yeah, One, yeah. Right? Um, Seether, have you heard of a band called yeah. Seether? Yeah, it's a heavy band, yeah. Oh, that's why I don't know. Uh, broken. No that, doubt. Don't speak. Don't speak's a great one. Uh, Bruno Mars, when I was your man, right? Oh, like, I didn't think of that. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. A uh, Drake Hotline Bling. I don't know that one. Yeah, I know Drake is, but I don't know the song. Yeah, I know who Drake is, but I don't know his music. Okay, secure songs. Look at how old most of them are. Sunny and Cher, I got you, babe. Whitney Houston, I will always love you. The yeah. Beatles, love the Beatles, love me do. Um, Ed Sheeran, Thinking Out Loud. I love it. I, I really like it. He's so talented. Hey, I love him. The Plain White Tees, I love you. Mm -hmm. uh, John Legend, All of Me. Gorgeous song. Amazing song. Can't stand the man, but an amazing song. Uh, Michael Buble, Haven't Met You Yet. I don't know, for, I don't know that one. I don't know Michael Buble. I, can, I mean, I'm not, I, I can't think of that particular song. But. I'm trying to think of another. I don't know that song. Um, the Beach Boys, Wouldn't It Be Nice? Oh, yeah. Brian, Brian Adams, Everything I Do, I Do For You. Etta James, At Last. Classic. That is an amazing song. Yeah. Uh, Justin Bieber, Holy. Okay, I'll give you Justin Bieber. He's kind of disappeared. Oh, well, he's, got a, he's got a medical thing going on. But look at how many of those are old songs. Yeah, all. You know, Etta Most... James goes back to, what, the 40s? Even John Legend's 10 years old. That song, that's not new. Sonny and Cher. Whitney Houston's got to be older than that. Whitney Houston's got to be like yeah. 20 years old, right? Uh, yeah, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Beach Boys are the 60s. Yep, yeah, that's the 60s Beach Boys too. And and a lot of the songs that are more like avoidant, we don't even, we we have no clue what they are. No. Um, now, here's the ones that are mixed. People who have mixed relationships. Come here, come here, come here. Go away, go away, go away. Okay. Carrie Underwood before he cheats. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Yeah. Um, got ya. Do you know who Got Ya is? Uh, somebody that I used to know. Oh yeah, I know that song. You're just somebody that I used to know. I know the song. Yeah, I know the song. Yeah, I know the song. Uh, Taylor Taylor Swift, Bad Blood. But she supposedly wrote that about a woman. Remember, she was having a uh, she was having a, a fight with somebody. It was a woman, another singer. And that was supposedly directed to her. You're just somebody that I used to know. That was not about a romance from what I understand. What I remember Sam Smith. I'm not the only one. Oh yeah. I know that tune. Uh, Neo. So sick. Don't know. Neo, Neo. Neo. Look at that. I don't even know how to say it. Uh, Bonnie Raitt. I can't make you love me. Great song. Adele again, rolling in the deep. Right. We could have had it all. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Rihanna featuring Drake with work and Eminem featuring Rihanna, Love the Way You Lie. So uh, I know the last one with Eminem, I don't know the first one. I thought that was just so I thought those were so interesting. So um, all right, we are gonna get out of here on time. This is fantastic. So thank you everyone for watching. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you. Um, let's see what's coming up Thursday. Uh we will be is it Thursday morning, Friday morning, Thursday, after, Thursday evening, 715. We will be here for life with, with Mary Walter radio, which is our political podcast. And you can watch it here on YouTube. You can watch it on getter and the audio will be uh, uploaded to Apple, Apple and, and Spotify. All right. So those two will be up there. That'll be up there. Now, Friday, I will be on, I'm trying to remember Friday. I will be on the David Webb show on Sirius XM Patriot channel, 125. 
from 9 a.m. to noon. Then Monday, I am in for Todd Starnes from noon to three. I think that's it. I'm not 100% sure. Things have been changing so quickly that my schedule, I have nothing. And then I have, you know, like three shows scheduled during the week. So it's just that time of year. But um, of course, I post everything. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, follow me on Getter at Mary Walter Radio, where I put everything. Follow me on Twitter at Mary Walter Radio. Are you sensing a theme? Subscribe to my YouTube page, Mary Walter Radio. And you can follow me on Truth Social at Mary Walter. I actually got Mary Walter, not Mary Walter Radio. So <laughs> I got that on there. So um, yeah, and please, as always, please like the podcasts. Go back, watch old ones. Uh, the Life with Mary Walter shows are not time sensitive. They're non-political. So uh, they tend to be a little bit more lighthearted. And please subscribe. Uh, we, we do appreciate that. And listen, I don't care if you go to YouTube and just put the video on or to Spotify or Apple and just let it run and leave the room. <laughs> I'm I mean, okay with that. I'm happy you're watching the content, but if you want to let it run, eh, let it run. Exactly. We prefer you watch the content, obviously, but maybe. no, maybe. Well, yeah, no, I do. And here's the other <laughs> thing. Um, oh, here, Monkey Bob says no Annie song. Oh Annie yeah, song. Annie song, John Denver. Even oh, John he, Denver. Hey, John like, Denver. Is, is, yeah. that? is that the one? Even though we ain't got money, I'm so in love with you, honey. That's that's it. That's Annie's song. Yeah. Is that is that John Denver? Or is that Prairie? Is that Pure Prairie, Prairie League? Pure Prairie, Prairie League. League. Mm -hmm. That's that was my very first not, like adult album. My my aunt got that for me. Was Pure Prairie League because um, everything up until then was like Partridge Family and David Cassidy. But my right. aunt got me. That was like my first adult album. You know, I was like, <laughs> oh, this is so exciting. You know, so that was it. No, any song. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good one. I think there's a lot more out there. Um, uh, also. Guys, if you have comments about the show, things you think we could change, things you like, things you don't like, totally open to your comments. You can leave them always on, on YouTube. I'll see them, uh, you know, and I can respond to them there. I just want to leave them in the comments. I We really love your feedback. We appreciate your feedback because we want to make the show better. We want to get make the show more popular. We want more people watching it, obviously. So um, let us know. Give us some feedback because... Without you, you know, we, we don't know if we're doing well. If we, you hate it, you love it, whatever. Please let us know. All right, we'll see you on Thursday, 7.15 p.m. Will you be here, James? Check. Check. All right. Yeah. Uh, John says, great show. Thank you, John. He's so good. Sure. That's because I promised him a beer at our local bar. <laughs> I'll take it. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks so much. Wait, how come? Oh, I see why. Hold on. This one, I have to do this. Life with Mary Walter.